Now, I am fired up at the moment and feel like yelling a lot. That's what I normally do. I yell at you because I'm for you. This morning will be a little different. I disciplined myself to write down what I would say so I can read it for you and not get carried away. And we realize it's Christmas and I'm still here talking. So you can, you can be grateful for that. I want to read to you the text that I read five years ago on this date and that I preached a sermon on that launched what was then a very, uh, seemed to be almost a silly idea of a church. Psalm 127, verse 1, Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. And woe to the pastor or church that forgets that verse. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful for your goodness to us. We're grateful for your mercy that's new every morning. We're grateful for your son Jesus who is alive and who is risen and reigning over heaven and earth. We're grateful for your Holy Spirit that you've sent to fill your people and to create a new people and to move through our city bringing healing where there is brokenness and bringing hope where there is only discouragement and doubt, bringing salvation and freedom where there is only bondage and slavery. Father, we pray this morning that the next 35, 40 minutes or so would be an opportunity for us to exercise the muscles of gratefulness. Exercise the muscles of remembering. Exercise the muscles of looking to see evidence of your grace all around us, lest we move forward thinking that by some means of our own strength, this has happened. We stand here this morning, Father, and we make it our intention to remind our heart and mind and soul that what is happening is a direct result of your work and your grace and your power and your desires and your plans coming to fruition, oftentimes in spite of us, but always through us. And that just marvels us greatly. So help us, Father, to be able to enter into worship this morning at a level that equals and honors the reality of who you are, and we'll be careful to give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. This day is only going to get better. I mean, after I'm done talking, we get to go sing and worship and barbecue and baptize people. Man, I'm really pumped. I'm almost tempted to skip this and get right to the baptisms. (laughs) Nobody say amen. That was good. Have you ever stood at the base of a mountain? craned your neck to look towards the top and wonder how in the world would one even begin an expedition to the summit? I have. Yesterday, in fact. But the mountain was not made up of rock and dirt. Rather, I was staring up at a massive mountain of grace. A mountain of mercy, unmerited favor, and kindness from the Lord to us as a church family. And my expedition, my challenge, was attempting to encapsulate and review in a few hundred words all that God has has done to us, for us, and through us over the past five years. That appeared a task more than just daunting, overwhelming. That appeared to be a task that was impossible. Impossible because, you see, not only has God been more gracious to us than we deserve, catch this, God has been more gracious to us than we can comprehend. So it's good every once in a while for a family to stop, look around, and explore the mountain of grace the Lord has placed them on. It's good for our perspective. It's good for our soul. And my goodness... What a view. Now for those who might be new to GCC, it would be easy to walk in and think, wow, these guys appear like they have their act together. But if you've been around very long, that comment probably makes you chuckle. (laughs) I heard laughter over here by some of our elders, I think. (laughs) Act together? Hardly. More like barely holding together. Our story is not one of perfect planning and brilliant execution. 
Our story is not about wise market analysis and careful strategizing. Our story is about a few simple believers who needed lots of help, who still need lots of help, who had no idea what they were doing, who made lots of mistakes and still make lots of mistakes, and who are still learning to trust Jesus in the normal everyday stuff of life. There is no band of heroes behind this story. There are only humble, needy people who have been coming together for five plus years now to look to, learn about, and attempt to grow in telling others about Jesus. So today I'm going to tell you a story. And you may think, a story? I came to hear a sermon. But just hold your horses there a little bit. Telling stories not only has a very rich history across the fabric of humanity, telling stories has a rich history across the story of the Bible. Before there was the internet or laptop computers or cell phones or the printing press or paper or Flickr or Facebook or photo albums, there were only stories. And the telling of these stories was essential not only for the entertainment's sake of a people, it was essential for sustaining tribes and communities. It was how people passed important values and traditions down from generation to generation. If you wanted to keep important information alive, you wrapped it in a good story and told it around the campfire because there's nothing like a good story, especially if it's true. And that's what we find ourselves in the middle of today, an unfolding story. But really, the big story of GCC is simply the accumulation of many small stories put together, tied together and woven together by God's grace, a few of which I'll share with you today. During the months of 2006 and 2007, several young couples were meeting with my parents, Greg and Candy McPherson, several times a week to be mentored in our marriage and our family. For those of you who are new, that was the statesman who prayed to give thanks to the Lord a few minutes ago. Over the course of our training, the conversation would occasionally turn to church, theology, doctrine, ecclesiology, our own experiences. The more we talked and wrestled, the more a picture seemed to begin getting scratched on the chalkboard of our minds and a fire began getting stoked in the pit of our souls. A seed was being planted. A vision was beginning to form. I'll never forget the night Dad first said the words, Hey, you know, what if we planted a church? Kind of like someone would say, hey, you know, what if we tried to go to the moon? We chuckled, but with those words, it began. Though it would not come to fruition for a few years, the cat was out of the bag. The horses were out of the proverbial barn and running like all get out. The only problem was that they had no idea where to run. So we started meeting on Sunday mornings, nothing more than an informal Bible study, really. Then Adam and Aaron joined our motley crew, and Ray and Kathy joined a few weeks later. That raised our number to a stout 14. We were ready to rock now. That summer, the men began meeting to start putting a plan together. If we were going to plant a church, we had to figure out how one went about doing that. What we ended up doing was reading way too many books and choking on our own inadequacies and lack of knowledge. But we were hungry, so we kept pressing in. For 18 months, we met twice a week, Tuesdays and Thursday nights, reading through Wayne Grudem's Systematic Theology, studying the Nicene Creed, the Apostles' Creed, the Baptist Confession of Faith, the Westminster Confession of Faith, Olson's The Story of Christianity, Lutzer's The Doctrines That Divide. We studied statements of faith. We visited different churches. We talked to different church leaders. We studied different denominations, historical trends, and models of church planting and evangelicalism. I still have the books and notebooks in my office from those days. Stacks and stacks of books. While we might not have appeared to be making much progress, we were working very hard at it. (laughs) But the more reading we did, the more people we talked with, the more carcasses we saw stacking up on the side of the road. This church planting venture had burned and buried a lot of people. What in the world were we thinking? Who were we? We weren't anyone special. The thing was to go and to stand and to last and to make an impact. We were clear on one thing. It would have to be a work of God's grace. Incidentally, we're still very, very clear on that point. After much prayer and counsel, we decided that the next step was to enlarge our team. It wouldn't be the church plant itself. Whoa, whoa, not yet. We didn't want to rush anything or be premature. We needed to gather a few more like-minded people. 
Really, we were just cowards, but we couched it with these spiritual terms. We needed more horsepower, we said. Adam put it like this in a meeting one night, I'll never forget. Guys, it's like we're pulling a sled of gasoline and explosives up a hill. You remember this? If we open the doors now, guys, too soon, and people start coming, you might as well stack 10,000 pounds of rockets on that sled. If you don't have enough horsepower to pull that baby to the top, we'll get dragged to the bottom of the canyon in a burning, fiery, fiery ball of death. Well, that was very helpful, Adam. Thank you. (laughs) Now that we're all feeling confident, what should we do next? Judging by the looks of all of our faces, we got the message clearly. So we decided to go for more horsepower. We identified 15 or so families we thought might have an interest, and we put our plan in motion to make sure they had a clear vision for where we were going and maybe to weed out a few of the weak at heart. I I wrote a small church planning team manual. Explain our vision, values, theology, and methodology. <clears throat> it topped out at a robust 34 pages, single spaced. It was the war and peace of all church planning manuals. <laughs> this would be a commitment, it said. No going back, it said. We would need a yes or no answer, it said. If you said yes, you'd be on board and you'd be in it for the long haul, it said. We didn't give them Adam's burning ball of fiery death scenario on the bottom of the canyon analogy. But it was in the front of all of our minds as we explained the commitment, and it probably showed. Surprisingly, we only heard back from a few families. <laughs> Perfect. Our plan must be working. But the ones we did hear back from were excited. So in the spring of 2007, we held our first official church planting team meeting. Now we were almost 10 families strong. The Bushies, the Cunninghams, the Stennis clan, the Avalas, the Ballards, and the Gibbons added their shoulder to the plow. We didn't tell them they were pulling gasoline and explosives. <laughs> so we started to do a little mini church. The first test model was in the water now, and we were checking for holes. There were many. Dad, myself, Adam, along with John Piper and Mark Driscoll, carried a majority of the teaching load, thanks to video. I'd lead worship, then one of us would stand and preach to all 25 people sitting there together. Do you remember those three-hour services, Mom? We took our first retreat in October and spent all weekend laying out the plans. Timelines, to-do lists, doctrines to be discussed, leadership questions to answer, ministry philosophy to nail down, articles to write, bylaws to adopt, constitution to write and build, corporations to apply for. But maybe the biggest deal was a name to be picked. We started with 12 I'll spare you some of the wilder ones. Ray, do you remember any of those ones? Where's Ray? Ray? Yeah, you do, I think. One of Ray's picks, I believe, was something about... uh, Church to what's happening now. now. That's right. (laughs) What's happening now? I have no idea. Perfect. That's how we felt. I think Ray actually voted for that one, too. We ended up narrowing it down to three, and then came the vote. Grace Covenant Church won the day. From there, we began putting into action the plans we'd made from the retreat. All of the men continued to meet on Tuesday nights, and then the council, consisting of Ray McPherson, Adam James, Greg McPherson, myself, Eric Chase, and Mike Bushy. Is Mike here this morning? Where's Mike at? Mike, there's Mike right over there. We would meet on Thursday nights for hours. Remember that, Mike? Mike, we didn't have a picture of Mike. We couldn't find a picture of Mike. He's part of the church, so what happened now? I can never find him. <laughs> Where's Mike? No idea. I've estimated those men in that picture and Mike Bushy put in well over 200 hours, to be exact. Praying, talking, wrestling, planning, making sure the footings were level and the foundation was square. We talked theology, doctrine, vision, church polity. You name it, we covered it. And it wasn't always easy sledding, was it, men? Many nights, there were very difficult discussions. Hard things were addressed head on. Nothing got swept under the rug. We battled and wrestled and butted heads. This was not six guys holding hands running through the tulips. This was real men doing hard work of asking the tough questions. This was heavy lifting in the mud. 
but with humble hearts, persistence, and a passion for the church, these men studied on. Is Eric here this morning? They were going to drive from the Tri-Cities. Where are you at, Eric? Where are you at, Eric? Say something. Speak. Hey, yo, vato. There he is. Is Eric Chase up there? Wave your hand, Eric. There he is right there. The guy looks like Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda with the beard. Few men I know have the pistache to do what those men did during those days. God was forging us, and at times the fire got pretty hot. But the Lord delivered, didn't he, Mike? And we were all better for it. Most didn't ever get to be. Most don't ever get to be around such men in their lifetime. I got to spend hours every week with him, and I'm a better husband and father for it. I count it a privilege to call them my friends. They were doing the hard work so that this church would have a shot at making it. They could not see your faces in their minds, but they were thinking of you and doing the hard work that they felt would honor the Lord and bless you and give GCC a firm foundation to stand on. I wrote in my journal after one particular long night, if the Lord tarries and GCC is still standing as a God-centered, gospel-spreading, Christ-exalting church in five years, 50 years, or 100 years, it will be in no small part to the faithful labor and prayer of those men this night. Thank you, Lord, for letting me run with such as these. But there were problems Who would lead this show? We were all riding too many horses at once already. And it was only a matter of time, as Ray pointed out, until the horses parted ways and we were in trouble. Now the rubber was meeting the road and the pressure was beginning to build. Another journal entry during those days was as follows. Father, what strange days these are. Pivotal, paramount, watershed in my life and in the life of our little church planting team. Just when we think there's light at the end of the tunnel, the door gets slammed shut and we're left in total darkness again. What gives, Father? At times it seems impossible and then everything crashes in again and it appears... At times it seems possible and then everything crashes in again and it appears hopeless. More than appears hopeless, it is hopeless. No way out, no options, no solutions. We had a long, difficult meeting last night. The men are tired and weary and there seems to be no solution in sight. Has all of this been in vain, Lord? Is all of this hard work for nothing? I cannot think it's so, but I just don't see how you're going to make it work. <laughs> That's perfect, isn't it? I can still remember the Sunday morning, January 14, 2008. The question got posed, do we move forward or do we roll it up and call it quits? We laid the possible options out on the table and talked it all over. Greg needed to stay leading life track. Josh wanted to go to school. Adam was full-time in other ministries. But this plant needed the attention of one man. There was the possibility of Josh doing both, but that would require a significant amount of work for everyone else. Were we up for it? Enter Julie Ballard. That picture was taken last night down at uh, the Igloo Tavern. (laughs) Sean, we might need to talk afterwards. Again. Again. (laughs) Oh, another talk about Julie. I think Julie Ballard summed it up best after our meeting of which she had decided, of which we had all decided to pray about this decision for a week and come back to decide next week. She came up to me in her normal, tender, beat around the bush self. (laughs) That was a joke. (laughs) There's nothing tender or beat around the bush about Julie Ballard. I was just grateful she didn't have that cue stick in her hand. Okay, Josh, here's the deal. I'm a black and whiter. If you know Julia, that's one of her lines. I'm a black and whiter. So 
So let me make this easy for you, buddy. The only option that's not on the table is this church plant going away. So you make it work. However you got to, you can. Whatever it takes. And we'll pull our share of the load. But Grace Covenant Church stays. This is our church family. And God's doing too much good stuff here to stop now. Hope that simplifies things a little bit for you. See you at the vote next week. (laughs) Yay, Julie. (laughs) So a week later, the decision was made and a date was set. Josh would quit his job, start classes at Western, move his family to Portland, and we'd open the doors for business on May 18th. The blurry vision was starting to become a hard reality. Two weeks after our opening Sunday, Josh, Eric, and Adam visited Kent and Patty McMullen. We laid the vision on the table in their living room and asked if they were game to join. I distinctly remember Kent leaning forward on his elbows and saying to Adam and myself, where's Kent? Let me see if I have this straight. You've officially planned a church. Uh, The doors are open. People are coming. Josh is the lead pastor. Adam, the other elder. You'd like me to come on as the third. And Josh, the lead pastor, is moving to Portland to attend seminary for a year? Exactly, I said. Perfect, he replied. Just want to make sure I'd heard that right. (laughs) Four hours later, we left their house. What do you think, Adam asked. I shook my head. Never going to happen. Well, it it was a nice thought. Kent called me the next day. I think we should meet again. Okay, I said, so we did. Another four-hour ordeal. Again, Adam asked me, what do you think now? Again, I answered, nah. Many more phone conversations later, and after a particularly fun and meaningful drive home from Rock Solid, Kent had given us his answer. He was in. The leadership team was now set. Josh, Adam, Kent would serve as elders. Ray, Eric, and Mike would serve as deacons. We were off and rolling. Now at this point, I need to interrupt us and let you know it's very important that you understand we take eldership extremely seriously. To us, the elders set the tone of the church. Therefore, we resolved very early on that one of our chief jobs was to set the bar high with our example to the church. It was our conviction that the elders of the church do everything possible to maintain their dignity. At no point must they allow their juvenile natures to take over, no matter how tempting it might be. (laughs) And they must at all times strive to maintain a professional demeanor, especially (laughs) when in public. (laughs) This will ensure that the troops have respect for their leaders. And one of the most important jobs of those leaders is that they unashamedly stand before the people of God. (laughs) Lumps and all. And humbly direct the congregation's gaze heavenward. This, of course, is all to be done very humbly, without braggadocia or the, the bringing of attention to themselves. <laughs> Above all, the elders must be willing to see evil, listen to the needs of their people, and speak the truth. If they hold fast to these values, a church will know they have leaders worth following and will surely be on its way to health and vitality because leadership is everything. Okay, where were we? (laughs) 
Uh, yes, we soon outgrew to life track space due to the whopping 65 people now gathering with us on a Sundays. Ah! So the Lord provided us with a building the very week we needed it. Yeah, I asked, great, but can we afford it? How does 500 bucks sound, he said. A week, I asked. A month, he said. And I just laughed. God was at it again. Our first Sunday there was September 2008. We had 100 people. We about wet our pants. What on God's green earth were we supposed to do with 100 people? It got worse. By January 2009, we were 150. Now we were in deep. Not to mention the fact that while originally we had planned on me driving back once a month due to all the new faces showing up, I was now driving back every week. I would leave Portland Friday after classes, drive to Wenatchee reviewing Greek flashcards all the way, study for my sermon Saturday, preach Sunday, drive home Sunday night reviewing said flashcards, and be in Greek exegesis Monday morning at 7.30. Over the next three months, I put over 40,000 miles on my little car. Thankfully, someone noticed my bloodshot eyes, and they started putting me on a plane. Ah, much better. In November 2009, we were maxing out the Riverside Center, and again, had no place to go. Our shield meals were a blast, but they were becoming a logistical nightmare. It had been fun with 50, but 150, we were beginning to learn our first church planting lesson. With growth comes change. The goal stays the same, but the means by which you accomplish it will change if you are to survive. And we had no facility option that we knew of. What were we to do? The Lord again had plans, and at the 11th hour, the SDA facility on Western became available. We jumped on it. Now we could be in Wenatchee, and I remember walking in there thinking, this place is huge. Look at all the parking. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yeah, all the parking. (laughs) Soon, we had grown to two morning services, and over the course of the next three years, proceeded to grow by 100 people every year. The curve on the chart looks like that, if you're wondering. Like a roller coaster, hoping you're strapped in. Until this spring, when we pushed 600 people, we realized we were completely out of seats and parking. Again, we were stuck. Every rock had been turned over, every bush shaken. There were no options left. Where were we to go? And again, the Lord provided perfectly in His timing. And we're sitting in that provision today, celebrating our fifth anniversary in the fourth facility God's provided for us in five years. His grace is amazing. Amen. Amen. Yep. That's good. That's good. It's almost surreal to be standing up here talking to you this morning. Five years ago this day, I preached my guts out to 35 people in a hot and stuffy room in Kashmir. Reviewing the notes of that sermon a few weeks ago, I felt as if I should offer a public apology. (laughs) But what I may have lacked in content, I made up with passion. The heart of the message was clear. My text from Psalm 127, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it will labor in vain, and we believed it to be true. But looking back on our story, I not only see the many evidences of God's grace, I see many mistakes we made as well. It's clear to me now that when we started it, we probably planted a service, an event. We were not yet grounded fully in our gospel identity as a church family. That was a mistake that could have been deadly, yet for God's grace. Looking back, I say to my deep embarrassment and shame that if I were to be honest, I had a very small heart for the lost. Certainly I cared for them and I thought much about them, but they were not on the forefront of my thinking. I still view discipleship as taking Christians and making them more serious and devoted Christians. My missional ecclesiology had yet to develop fully and my gospel understanding was still very rudimentary and my understanding of the missional nature of the church was still very small and if I were perfectly honest, my passion to see lost people saved very low. It wasn't because I didn't want to see lost people saved. We talked and prayed about it constantly. That's why we planted the church. But if I was honest, I think it was simply that I lacked the faith to believe that God could actually truly save really, really lost people. (laughs) And of course, you can hear lots of gospel problems in that thinking. 
But hey, it's where I was at. But all of that changed when the Lord brought a certain young man to our church plant family. He had a lot of red hair. He'd sit in the back looking like he was hung over most Sunday mornings. At one time, I even thought I caught him making out with someone in the back row as I was preaching. <laughs> Chaz, are you here this morning? Is that true? Oh, that's not true. Okay. Okay. Should I have called you and clarified that before I said that? So that was not true. Okay, good. That's good to know. This was new territory for us as a church. He wasn't married with five kids and homeschooling. He was a real rebel. How exciting. I would later learn that GCC was the first church this 22-year-old young man had ever stepped foot in. A year later, he would stand and share his testimony with our church family. And I was floored. Here was a guy who had literally never been to church before in his life. And there he was saying that my preaching had connected dots for him about God and sin and wrath and salvation in Jesus. Now make no mistake, there were many, many, many more components to his testimony than just my preaching. But what struck me was this. The gospel was the power of God to save sinners. It really worked. Listening to his testimony, watching him get baptized, singing, all I have is Christ at the top of our lungs as he came up out of the water, which I've requested we sing today. And feeling the exhilaration of watching Jesus radically save someone like Chaz left me undone in the front row. Anyone remember that morning? Something was birthed in me that day. I remember clearly standing up after he was done and telling our church family, if we planted this church for the sole purpose of Chaz Cox hearing the gospel and responding in faith and then rolled up a shop this afternoon and quit, every drop of blood, sweat, and tears we had shed would have been worth it. I'm sure by now you're probably rolling your eyes. You're thinking, holy smokes, man, you're the lead pastor of the church and you're just figuring this out? (laughs) Well, no, it's not that I was just figuring it out, but it's that I was actually experiencing the power of its truth. There's a difference. I was believing it more than I had ever believed it before in my life, and I, I got to watch the Lord grow a young man up into a responsible, godly follower of Jesus who sat next to me on a bus in Chicago riding home from a conference a year later and said, you know... I think tonight the Lord has called me to give my life to preaching the gospel. I don't know what that will look like or when it will happen, but I'm in, Josh, 100%. And there it was right in front of me. I had just witnessed within our little messy church plant the Lord take a young man from total pagan to a potential preacher of the gospel. And it was awesome. And I love you, Chaz. I love you very much. You've taught me a lot about God's grace. And I want to keep learning from you so you keep growing. In those days as well, I was attending a retrain for my master's degree in missional leadership. And there I met Jeff Vanderstel. Between spending weekends with Jeff, Mark Driscoll, Ed Stetzer, John Piper, and many other godly men, my world was getting blown up. My mind was being worked. My heart stretched. My vision expanded. The gospel was exploding in my face. And the conviction that the church exists for the sake of mission was being cemented in my soul. My 40-page thesis at the end of my degree was on the kingdom of God that is present in the here and now on earth. And that kingdom has a a king who is Jesus, and that king has come on a mission of redemption 2,000 years ago, which resulted in a people being born, we know as the church, and this people were given a message to spend their life proclaiming, and that message was that there was a kingdom whose king was Jesus, who had come to rescue captive sinners and save them to send them to proclaim the good news of the gospel of the kingdom of God who had a king who came on a mission to save a people. You get the picture. The sent nature of the church would change everything for me. 
The rest of my thesis dealt with how to organize a church around these fundamental doctrines, how to avoid missional drift, how to build structures that supported this mission rather than hinder it, how to transition a church that was formerly built around events, and how to move it towards living out its gospel identity for mission in all of life. From this wrestling and study was birthed the vision of gospel communities. Now, if you're new to GCC, gospel communities is how we organize ourselves as a church to live out our identity as a family of missionary servants sent to make disciples who make disciples. Which means for us, church is not an event or location or building. Rather, it is a people by which the Lord is making supernaturally by His Spirit through the proclamation and demonstration of the gospel and sending into the culture. I'm going to blow my nose, so hang on. I'm back. Okay, Julie, could you hold this for me real quick? <laughs> That's okay. Thanks anyways. So now as a church, we had two primary focuses. Our air war served as the tip of the spear and comes to the preaching of the word from this pulpit. Every week we gather believers and unbelievers to hear the word of God preached, the glory of Jesus proclaimed, and the gospel of Christ explained and connected to all of normal life. Then we respond with singing and worship and song and giving and communion. This is our air war. Our ground war is where the real discipleship work happens. If the air war goes ahead and softens hard enemy targets, the ground war comes in and secures that ground for good. It is the hand-to-hand combat work. It's the slow, hard, full of skirmishes and casualties work. But it is the essential work that must be done if the ground, the air war pelted, is to be ultimately taken and kept. We call this ground war our gospel communities. It is where we covenant to live life together with a few other believers through the normal rhythms of life, living with gospel intention, loving our neighbors and the lost the Lord has put in our life as we invite them into our life to share life with us. And you need to know something. Sharon and I are convinced this is how the Lord has called every believer to live. This is not a model. This is not a technique. This is the average, normal life of someone who's been saved and sent by the Spirit of God for the work of the gospel. We're committed to living this way until our last breath. It's how we're discipling our children. It's how we're discipling those around us. We not only find it biblical, we find it extremely hard because it takes work. We find it extremely humbling because it regularly exposes how selfish Sharon is. Yeah, my mom says. My mom didn't believe that. Is Sharon here? Hey, babe. It exposes how selfish I am. But who wants to be honest? We find it prayer-inducing because you realize you are actually in need of the power of the Holy Spirit to live in this way. We find it exhilarating because it fills all of life with gospel purpose and gospel opportunity. And we have found it to be extremely life-giving because you get to do Life in community with those who love you, who care for you, who pray for you and who confront you in your sin and challenge you when you're weak and push you when you're tired and comfort you when you're low and forgive you when you sin against them. We had people missing up here this morning. Chris and Jen Foreman, Brian Blair, Bob is doing security. For all those reasons and more, we find living in community on mission to the lost brothers and sisters around us is the only way to live. But Sharon and I have not always thought this way, so don't get me wrong. We've always loved Jesus and made it our aim to follow him with all of our life, but there were simply some pieces missing. In fact, often we'd found ourselves over the past three or four years repenting to the Lord and each other for the selfish nature of much of how we had oriented and organized our lives. One last story and I'll be done to illustrate God's faithfulness. The fact is we had many regrets. One that Sharon would mention often was her co-workers at Central Washington Hospital. As an oncology nurse, and a dang good one at that, I might add, she developed many friends with the other nurses and CNAs there. But that was all that remained for us, co-workers. She would tell them, she would tell me their stories, and we'd often pray for them, but we never pursued them. We never oriented our life to invite them in to ours. And yes, Sharon was loving and kind and led a good example for them to see and did many kind things for them because she did genuinely love them, but we were not orienting our lives to live in a community on mission with the gospel so that we could 
pursue them with gospel intention. We were busy with our own stuff, frankly. So Sharon has spoken often about those days of missed opportunities, and while we know the Lord has forgiven us and there's grace for our mistakes, we still have had regrets. And then I got a phone call this week. As it turns out, one of Sharon's former co-workers, whom she loved very much and had talked to me about all the time back then, had come to GCC just eight weeks ago when we started our Lives We Believe campaign. Over that time, she had gotten connected with a few GCC folks and that she had met here and had been spending time with them in their gospel community. And then this past Wednesday, just four days ago, this good friend of Sharon's, a co-worker whom we felt we had missed our opportunity to share the gospel with almost 10 years ago at the home of a gospel community leader and his wife, gave her life to Jesus. You can say amen if you want. Now, I don't know what that does for you, but for Sharon and I, it has had a profound impact. It has reminded us again that Jesus is in the business of redemption. He redeems missed opportunities. He redeems failed relationships. He redeems selfish choices. He redeems actions made in foolish ignorance. He redeems foolish choices made in willful rebellion. Jesus is flat out in the business of redemption. Not through ignoring our sin as if it never happened, but in taking it upon himself and bearing the consequences of the reality that it did actually happen. His grace not only confronts us in our sin, it covers our sin with his own blood. And Sharon and I have been reminded so vividly of that this week in our own personal story that the gospel is really good news, isn't it? It's so, so good. So one of my big takeaways from the past five years is that Jesus loves to build his church. It is no accident, nor is it the result of any man's effort, that a small band of people who really had zero idea what they were doing five years ago, holding secret meetings in an office room in Kashmir, has now grown to almost 600 people today meeting in the heart of the city to proclaim Jesus has risen and is reigning and is ready to grant freedom and repentance and healing and forgiveness to any and all who would ask for it. I am convinced, GCC, that for all of the things we could stand here and marvel at that Jesus has done for us, we have not even begun to see all that he intends to do through us. I have a sense in my soul that he is just getting started. And the question is, as Julie asked me five years ago, are you in? Julie, would you mind standing by the door and asking everyone as they leave? that question you seem to get good results do you want to be a part of something bigger than yourself there's opportunity for that in the family of God my desire in taking a few moments on this our fifth anniversary day to rehash and retell a few of the stories that make us GCC is that it might give proper perspective on what this day is about. Today is not about the celebration of anyone's accomplishments. Today is a celebration of God's unwavering grace to unfaithful and needy people. Week in and week out, He has never failed. You have to understand, when churches plant, it is no small thing. The infant death rate for church plants is astronomically high. 3,000 men leave the pastor every month for reasons other than health and retirement, never to return. When a church plant lives past the first year, it should be taken as nothing short of God's sustaining hand. Now, I really need to be done, and I almost am, but I beg you to let me indulge myself one last privilege and it will be quick and that is to offer a few personal words of thanks and I know this is dangerous because to begin mentioning names means someone will inevitably inevitably be left out and there are dozens and dozens and dozens of names of people hundreds who have invested their life in this church but I, I need to mention a few if I were to be faithful
Sharon, honey, uh, you perhaps more than any person in this room have carried the weight of this work over the, the past five years. You are incredible. A woman of noble character. You have played a huge part in this story. When you looked at a tired, frustrated, and defeated husband six years ago and said, when are you going to start doing full-time what God has put you on earth to do? It was a changing point in my heart. But honey, that would mean we'd have to, and I spelled out all the changes it would entail, and you looked at me and said, exactly, let's do it, I'm in. Every guy needs a guy like that, doesn't he? The next day we were on the war path and haven't looked back. Six moves in five years. 152 nights spent alone while I traveled to school in other places. Two miscarriages, two more difficult pregnancies, and you haven't batted an eye. Your resolve has been unshakable, your faith strong, your your work ethic unmatched. You find your joy to shape our home around God's calling on our life, and it makes all the difference for me. You steady on, and I love you very much. You have navigated the unique challenges and opportunities the Lord has brought to our home with extraordinary dignity and grace and strength. You are a woman of great character. I bow in humble awe to your work ethic. I live to hear you laugh. I learn from how you parent our children, and I take notes as you grow in applying the gospel to your fear and unbelief. Little could I comprehend the gift God was giving me when my eyes fell on the strong, athletic, brown-eyed girl wearing the number 12. Today, I honor you before our church family and thank you for loving Jesus more than me and then being able to love your husband well because your priorities are straight. You are a gift to me and this church and I love you very much. To Adam and Kent, my fellow elders, you are leaders of leaders. You are yeoman. I even know what that is, but it sounds so cool. <laughs> you are workhorses. You are faithful. You are strong. You don't view ministry like it was a union job. You show up early. You work hard. You stay late. And you never, ever complain. You push me. You challenge me. You call me on the carpet. You love me. You set the bar high for me to follow in how you love your wives and your children. You are discerning. You are men of the word. There are few men on the planet from whom I have learned so much from, for whom I love so much, and for whom I have so much respect for. I would entrust my family to you in a heartbeat. There is not a man in this room who does not have much to learn from you in what it means to follow Jesus, love a wife, shepherd children, and lead in the church. I am humbled to work with you. I gladly submit to you as my fellow elders more than words can express. Oh, how I am grateful for and benefit from God's grace to you. I love you both very much. (laughs) To Chris, our executive deacon of operations, I'm almost done here. What is there to say, bro? The list is too long. Your timely hire was shot full of miracle after miracle. If you were not on staff, I would go insane, and then I'd fire myself. You are an integral part of what God's doing in this church family. Your extraordinary work ethic, your eye for detail, your heart to serve the elders, your gifts of business savvy, your industriousness, your humility, and your passion for the mission of God's church are the primary reasons why we're even standing in this room today. I love you, and I'm grateful for God's grace to you very much. To Jared, our deacon of worship, you are one of the most musically gifted bipedals I have ever met. It is a joy to sit under your leadership every Sunday. Your quick wit, your hilarious sense of humor, your creative mind, your desire to above all else lead God's people and then get out of the way are something most pastors only dream of but never experience. You bring what few leaders have and for that I am grateful for God's grace to you and I love you. To carry our deacon overseeing all things midi- media and th- medieval media, <laughs> kind of, of course, Carrie might say. 
and theological training. You are possibly one of the most diversely gifted men I know. I look up to you. I admire you. I learn from you. I'm grateful my children have such a man as you to call uncle. I love working late into the morning hours with you to serve the church. Your passion for the church is unmatched. Your work ethic is unmatched. You are steady. You are dependable. You are an anchor. And I am grateful for God's grace to you. I love you very much. To Eve, our deacon of administration, what can I say that you put up with all the aforementioned men should get you a round of applause alone? (laughs) You are the one who keeps us all moving with... Out you, everything would grind to a frozen standstill. And not only are you effective what you do, you are a party to boot. We couldn't have asked for better. Thanks for bringing your sunshine into the office every morning. And to the rest of our deacons, Jeff, Becky, Dave, Wendy, Chad, Julian, Scott, Rhonda, Chris, Tara, Renee, I am weakly blown away by how you serve our growing church family. You are selfless. You are servant-hearted. You are team players. You are examples to the flock. And you are fun to be around. Overseeing Grace Kids, hospitality, security, security, mercy needs, connect center, and a host of other responsibilities, you keep the skids greased to allow for healthy forward motion. For the skill and character you bring to your role, for your passion to serve the church, we as a church, the recipients of your efforts, and specifically we as the elders, express our gratefulness to God for his grace to you. We love you and appreciate you very much. <clears throat> And lastly, the church planning team. Landing gear's coming out. We're going to touch down. The original 11 families who climbed into, on the shore, scuttled the ships behind them, and turned their eyes inland, saying with resolve, let's go explore. Look what ha- God has done with the meager offering of a fish and loaves we brought him just a few short years ago. Your heart should be so full this morning. Grace Covenant Church, we have much to be thankful for. God's grace has been ridiculously lavished upon us, and he's still writing the story. My prayer is that God would use us, this church, to spread a passion in this valley for the glory of Jesus. That God would grant us the privilege of seeing more lost souls find their refuge in Jesus. That more men would gain a new vision for leading their homes, loving their wives, and discipling their children by learning to look to Jesus. That God would raise up more leaders among us, that new churches would be sent out and planted from us, and that God would allow us by his grace to play a small part in the epic and eternal story of his glory being gained throughout the earth because of the name and glory of Jesus. Now that's a story I want to be a part of, a story of grace, a story of glory. Let's pray. Father, we've not taken enough time as we ought to recall all the stories we could. There's too many. You've been too gracious and too kind. Father, we stand in humble awe of your grace and your mercy and your kindness. We ask that in the days to come you would continue granting grace and mercy and favor that we might more effectively and boldly and courageously and passionately proclaim and display and spread the gospel of the good news of the kingdom of God. The news that says there is freedom for the captives, there is sight for the blind, there is healing for the broken in the name of Jesus at the foot of a bloody cross, at the door of an empty tomb. There is hope where there is hopelessness. Father, keep us on our knees. Keep us needy. Keep us looking to you and keep us celebrating your grace in our life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.